Chapter 5 and something more. Pilot number 5. Have you sincerely tried and still failed? Perhaps you failed because there was something more that was needed to bring you the success you were seeking. Euclid's axiom says, the whole is equal to the sum of all the parts and is greater than any of its parts. This can be related, assimilated, and applied to every result or achievement. Conversely, any part is smaller than the whole. Therefore, it's important that you add all the necessary parts to complete the whole. A negative mental attitude is one of the primary causes of failure. You may be needlessly ignorant of facts, universal laws, and powers. You may know many of them but fail to apply them to a specific need. You may not know how you can affect, use, control, or harmonize with powers known and unknown. When you seek success with PMA, you keep trying. You keep searching to find something more. Failure is experienced by those who, when they experience defeat, stop trying to find the something more. It's easy when you learn the something more and experience the know-how. Give a puzzle to a child, and he may not solve it. If he keeps trying and learns how to solve it, he can then work it quickly. You aren't a child. But perhaps there are several of life's puzzles you would like to solve. You can solve them more easily with PMA. For example, there once was a songwriter who wrote a song but couldn't get it published. George M. Cohan bought it and added something more. The something more made George M. Cohan a fortune. He merely added three little words, hip, hip, hooray. Thomas Edison tried more than 10,000 experiments before he developed a successful incandescent lamp. But after each defeat he kept searching for something more until he found what he was looking for. When the unknown became known to him, innumerable electric light bulbs could be manufactured it was necessary only to apply the universal laws that had always existed but which had not been previously recognized as applicable for the specific invention. There are many cures and preventatives for diseases. But at a given time they may be unknown. The medical preventative for polio was unknown until Dr. Jonas Edward Salk used principles of universal law that were previously not applied by the medical profession for the prevention of this dreaded disease. You may make a million dollars by employing a success formula. If you lose your money, you can make another million and even more. That is, provided you know the formula and apply it. Suppose you didn't recognize the formula that helped you make your first million. You may fail in your second attempt because you deviate from the principles of success that are applicable. On your second attempt, you may need to make adjustments for changing conditions. But the principles will remain the same. Orville and Wilbur Wright succeeded in flying because they added something more. Many inventors came exceedingly close to inventing the airplane before the Wright brothers. The Wright brothers used the same principles that were employed by the others but they added something more. They created a new combination, so they succeeded where all others failed. The something more was rather simple. They attached movable flaps of a particular design to the edges of the wings so the pilot could control them and maintain the plane's equilibrium. These flaps were the forerunner to the modern aileron. You'll notice there's a common denominator to all these success stories. In each case, the secret ingredient was the application of a previously unapplied universal law. That made the difference. So, if you are standing on the threshold of success without being able to pass over, try adding something more. It needn't be much. The words flip, nip, hooray were all it took to make a hit tune. Tiny flaps were all it took to make an airplane fly after others failed. It isn't necessarily the quantity of something more, but the inspired quality that counts. Why did the Supreme Court decide that Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone? Many persons claim to have invented the telephone before Alexander Graham Bell. Among those who held prior patents were Gray, Edison, Dalbert, McDonough, Vanderweide, and Rees. Philip Rees was the only one who apparently came close to success. The little difference that made the big difference was a single screw. Reese didn't know that if he had turned one screw one quarter of a turn, 
he would have transformed inter asterisk rupted current into continuous current. Then he would have been successful. That Reese knew what had to be done in order to transmit speech by electricity is very apparent, for in his first paper he said, as soon as it is possible to produce, anywhere and in any manner, vibrations whose curves shall be the same as those of any given tone or combination of tones, we shall receive the same impression as that tone or combination of tones would have produced on us. Asterisk the court further noted, Reese discovered how to reproduce musical tones, but he did no more. He could sing through his apparatus, but he could not talk. From the beginning to the end he has conceded this. As in the case of the Wright brothers, the something more be added was comparatively simple. He switched from an intermittent to a continuous current, the only type capable of reproducing human speech. The two currents are exactly the same direct current. Intermittent means breaking with a slight pause. Specifically, Bell kept the circuit open instead of breaking the circuit intermittently as Reese had done. The court concluded. Reese never thought of it, and he failed to transmit speech telegraphically. Bell did, and he succeeded. Under such circumstances it is impossible to hold that what Rees did was an anticipation of the discovery of Bell. To follow Rees is to fail, but to follow Bell is to succeed. The difference between the two is just the difference between failure and success. If Rees had kept on he might have found out the way to succeed, but he stopped and failed. Bell took up his work and carried it on to a successful result. His silent senior partner inspired him to success, R.G. Eli Tuergeno, builder of heavy earth-moving equipment, motivates thousands of persons with his inspirational speeches. In these talks, he refers reverently to my senior partner. He tells about the inspiration and help he has received from the partner. Lettrenu had little formal education. But he has performed feats of engineering that are astounding. As a subcontractor on the Great Hoover Dam in Nevada, Lettrenu lost a fortune because he ran into an unexpected strata of rock. The cost of drilling through the rock was more than he had calculated in estimating his contract. So he went broke trying to fulfill his end of the bargain. But instead of brooding over his loss, Lettrenu turned to pray Oizra. How did he pray? By expressing gratitude profound gratitude for what he had left a sound body, a strong pair of hands, a brain that could think, and something more. In my hour of greatest distress, said Lettrenu, I found my greatest asset in the revelation and discovery of a silent senior partner. I have since recognized this partner in my personal and business life. TG very thing I have everything I have done that has been worth will I owe to him. Napoleon Hill was associated with Mr. Lettrenu for 18 months and had an opportunity to observe him closely. By this time Lettrenu had become a well-known inspirational lecturer. He devoted much of his time to traveling around the country in his private plane, preaching his message, it's wonderful to be in partnership with God. One night when the two men were flying home from a speaking engagement in North Carolina, something interesting happened. Soon after his pilot took off, Mr. Lettrenu went to sleep. In about 30 minutes Napoleon Hill saw him take a little notebook from his pocket and write several lines in it. After the plane landed, Napoleon Hill asked Mr. Lettrenu if he remembered writing in his notebook. Why no, exclaimed Lettrenu. He immediately pulled the notebook from his pocket and looked at it. He said, here it is I've been looking for this for several months. Here's the answer to a problem that has kept me from completing a machine we are working on. When you receive a flash of inspiration, write it down this may be the something more that you are looking for. We believe that communication with infinite intelligence is through the subconscious mind. We believe you should establish the habit of immediately writing down flashes of inspiration as they are communicated to you from the subconscious to the conscious. Albert Einstein developed intricate and profound theories regarding the universe and the natural laws that control it. Yet he used only the simplest but most important of instruments ever invented, a pencil and a piece of paper. He wrote down his questions and answers, 
you will develop your mental powers when you lean and develop the habit of asking yourself questions when you learn and develop the habit of using pencil and paper to write down your questions, ideas, and answers. It is unlikely that Einstein and other scientists would have come to their successful conclusions unless they had learned from the recorded knowledge of mathematicians and scientists who preceded them. It is also unlikely that Einstein would have tried unless he had been motivated to search for universal principles after having developed the habit of engaging in thinking time and action. Do you know of any great thinker, or person of achievement, who does not make notes of ideas that occur to him? Learn creative thinking from the creative thinker. Your Creative Tower and Applied Imagination by Alex F. Osborne, of the advertising firm of Batten, Barton, Durstein, and Osborne, have inspired hundreds of thousands of persons to engage in creative thinking. What is equally important, these people have been motivated to positive, constructive action. Thinking is not creative unless it is followed through with action. Osborne, like so many creative thinkers, uses a notepad and a pencil as favorite working tools. When an idea occurs, he jots it down. He, like other great men of accomplishment, engages in thinking, planning, and study time. Alex Osborne stated an obvious truth when he said, everyone has some creative ability, but most people haven't learned to use it. Osborne's brainstorming methods, explained in his easily read textbook Applied Imagination, are being employed in college classrooms, factories, business offices, churches, clubs, and in the home. Brainstorming, as developed by Osborne, is a very simple method whereby two or more persons use their collective imaginations to come up with ideas that flash from their subconscious to their conscious minds in answer to a question incorporating a specific problem. The ideas are written down just as fast as they strike the minds of the participants. No critical judgment is permitted until after many ideas are written down. Later the ideas are screened and judged to determine their practicality and value. La Salle College in Philadelphia, and many universities throughout the country, teach well-rounded courses in creative thinking which include the methods used by creative thinkers in many phases of business and industry. It was just such creative thinking that enabled Dr. Elmer Gates to make this world a better place in which to live. Dr. Gates was a great American teacher, philosopher, psychologist, scientist, and inventor. During his lifetime, he developed hundreds of inventions and discoveries in the various arts and sciences. He did his creative thinking by sitting for ideas. Dr. Gates' own life proved that his methods of brain and body building could develop a healthy body and increase the efficiency of the mind. Napoleon Hill recalls how, armed with a letter of introduction from Andrew Carnegie, he went to visit Dr. Gates at his Chevy Chase laboratory. When Napoleon Hill arrived, Dr. Gates' asterisk secretary told him, I'm sorry, but I'm not permitted to disturb Dr. Gates at this time. How long do you think it will be before I can see him? Napoleon Hill asked. I don't know, but it might take as long as three hours, she responded. Do you mind telling me why you are unable to disturb him? She hesitated and then responded, he is sitting for ideas. Napoleon Hill smiled. What does that mean sitting for ideas? She returned the smile and said, maybe we'd better let Dr. Gates explain. I really don't know how long it will take, but your WEL come to wait. If you prefer to come again, 111 see if I can make a definite appointment for you. Mr. Hill decided to wait. It was a valuable decision. What he learned was well worth waiting for. This is how Napoleon Hill tells what happened. When Dr. Gates finally came into the room and his secretary introduced us, I jokingly told him what his secretary had said. After he read the letter of introduction from Andrew Carnegie, he responded pleasantly, Would you be interested in seeing where I sit for ideas and how I go about it? He led me to a small, soundproof room. The only furniture in the room consisted of a plain table and a chair. On the table were pads of paper, several pencils, and a push button to turn the lights off and on. In our interview Dr. Gates explained that when he was unable to obtain an answer to a problem, 
he went into the room, closed the door, sat down, turned off the lights, and engaged in deep concentration. He applied the success principle of controlled attention, asking his subconscious mind to give him an answer to his specific problem, whatever it might be. On some occasions ideas didn't seem to come through. At other times they would immediately flow into his mind. And in some instances it would take as long as two hours before they made an appearance. As soon as ideas began to crystallize, he would turn on the lights and begin to write. Dr. Elmer Gates refined and perfected more than 200 patents which other inventors had undertaken but which asterisk had fallen just short of success. He was able to add the missing ingredients the something more. His method was to begin by examining the application for the patent and its drawings until he found its weakness, the something more that was lacking. He would bring a copy of the patent application and drawings into the room. While sitting for ideas, he would concentrate on finding the solution to a specific problem. When Napoleon Hill asked Dr. Gates to explain the source of his results while sitting for ideas, he gave the following explanation, the sources of all ideas are 1. Knowledge stored in the subconscious mind and acquired through individual experience, observation, and education. 2. Knowledge accumulated by others through the same media, which may be communicated by telepathy. 3. The great universal storehouse of infinite intelligence, wherein is stored all knowledge and all facts, and which may be contacted through the subconscious section of the mind. When I sit for ideas, I may tune into one or all of these sources. If other sources of ideas are available, I do not know what they are. Dr. Elmer Gates found the time to concentrate and think in his search for something more. He knew specifically what he was looking for and he follows through with positive. In Chapter 7, we will discuss how you can learn to see so that your search for something more will be made easier. In your search, you may fail. But in failing you may succeed in discovering something even greater. Ask yourself, why? Get into action. The Bible, Webster's New Collegiate Dictionary, and a good encyclopedia should, we believe, be in every home. They also can help in your search for something more. You don't need to be ashamed to be a failure like Christopher Columbus. Look in your Encyclopedia Britannica and you'll find the thrilling, exciting story of Christopher Columbus. He studied astronomy, geometry, and cosmography at the University of Pavia. The Book of Marco Polo, Theories of Geographers, Reports, and Traditions of and Something More 63 Mariners, as well as floating works of art and craftsmanship of non-European origin cast up by the sea all these stimulated his imagination. Step by step over the years he came to the firm belief, through inductive reasoning, that the world was a sphere. Having reached this conclusion, he was convinced through deductive reasoning, that the Asiatic continent could be reached by sailing westward from Spain just as well as Marco Polo had reached it by traveling east. He developed a burning desire to prove his theory. He sought the necessary financial backing, ships, and men to explore the unknown and find something more he got into action. He kept his mind on objective. Over a period to ten years any was often on the verge of necessary help. But the deception of a king the ridicule, su suspicion, and fear of subordinate government officials the disbelief of those who wanted to help him but who at the last moment refused because of the skepticism of their scientific advisors all brought defeat after defeat. He kept trying. In 1492 he received the help for which he had so persistently searched and prayed. In August of that year he sailed westward for India, China, and Japan. He was on the right course and headed in the right direction. You know the story? After he landed on the islands in the Caribbean, he returned to Spain with gold, cotton, parrots, curious arms, mysterious plants, unknown birds and beasts, and several natives. He thought he had achieved his objective and had reached the islands off India. He had failed. He had not reached Asia. But, Without being aware of it immediately, Columbus had found something more. Quite a bit more. You, like Christopher Columbus, may fail to reach your high major objectives, or your magnificent obsessions. 
you, like him, may fail in your efforts to reach a distant destination in the realm of the unknown. But you may discover something more something equaling the wealth of the Americas. You, like him, may inspire and direct those who follow you to head in the right direction, on the right course, and to continue further into the unknown until they achieve the worthwhile objectives you conceived. You, like Columbus, have the time and the power to think. You, like him, can persistently strive with a positive mental attitude to achieve your definite major aims to find something more. You don't need to be ashamed to be a failure like Christopher Columbus. And something more. How can you apply it? By now you should be in a position to extract principles from specific illustrations so that you can relate, assimilate, and use them. We agree with Admiral H.G. Rickover in the fundamental truths of his statement. Among the young engineers we interview we find few who have received thorough training in engineering fundamentals or principles, but most have absorbed quantities of facts much easier to learn than principles but of little use without application of principles. Once a principle has been acquired it becomes a part of one and is never lost. It can be applied to novel problems and does not become obsolete as do all facts in a changing society. Learn the principles. Apply them. If you're not making satisfactory progress toward achieving your aims, look for the something more. It may be known or unknown. But you'll find it, if you take the necessary time to study, think, plan, and search for it. Now this chapter would not be complete without reference to Cosmic Habit Force. Use Cosmic Habit Force is one of the 17 success principles. And the concept of Cosmic Habit Force is easy to understand. For it is a name that we have given to applied power of any natural, or universal, principle or law, known or unknown. Cosmic Habit Force can be simply defined as, the use of universal law, whether it is known or unknown to you. As an example, it's easy to understand that when an object falls to the ground, the law of gravity is being applied. And, therefore, if you want an object to fall from a given height, you use cosmic habit force. And in this particular instance the law of gravity. But the law of gravity, or any other law, is not in itself a power. Yet when you properly use the principle, then power is employed according to universal law. And thus, the breaking of the atom, every invention, every chemical formula, every psychic phenomenon, every individual action and reaction be it physical, mental, or spiritual is the result of the use of natural law. For every result there is a cause. And the result is brought about through the use of cosmic habit force. Again, man is a mind with a body. And he can think. It is through. Asterisk from Education and Freedom, by H.G. Rickover, published by E.P. Dutton & Co., in thinking that he learns how to use cosmic habit force. And his thinking can bring the thoughts he thinks into reality. This concept is not difficult to comprehend, for in 1905 Albert Einstein gave to the world his now famous formula, E equals me 8. This formula explains the relationship between energy and matter. When matter approaches the speed of light, we call it energy, and as the velocity slows down to zero, it remains matter. In the formula, E is energy, M is mass or matter, and A represents the velocity of light. And thus we see that Einstein's formula is a word symbol of one of the laws of cosmic habit force. And by understanding and applying this formula man has been able to turn matter into energy and energy into matter, and to use atomic power for constructive purposes such as, to light an entire city, to power ships, or even for such everyday affairs as to develop heat for cooking. And something more we can now see that because matter and energy are the same thing, everything in the universe is related. Now you've got a problem. That's good. And you'll learn in the next chapter how to adapt many of the lessons learned in this chapter to your own me and then you will be able successfully to meet the problems created by the universal law of change, which like all natural law is the result of cosmic habit force. 11. Pilot number 5. Thoughts to steer by. And something more. 1. 
and something more. What does the important principle contained in this chapter mean to you and how can you apply it? 2. If you have failed in an endeavor, could it be because you lack something more a missing number in your combination to success? 3. The whole is equal to the sum of all the parts and is greater than any of its parts. Are any missing parts keeping you from success? 4. The little difference between success and failure is often something more, hip, hip, hooray. A movable wing flap. A quarter turn of a screw. 5. Are you in partnership with Eli Tuino's silent senior partner? 6. Use the simplest, but most important, of instruments ever invented paper and pencil to write down flashes of inspiration when they occur. 7. How does the technique of brainstorming differ from that of sitting for ideas? What is the value of each? 8. Use the success principle of controlled attention. 9. Don't be afraid to be a failure like Christopher Columbus. 10. Have you established the habit of learning fundamental principles, or do you merely absorb quantities of facts? You don't need to be ashamed to be a failure like Christopher Columbus.